What does it mean more than a mother campaign? A woman is not only a mother. A woman is an active role for society. A woman is playing her role as an active individual in all fields. So we have witnessed some cultures in Africa which actually unfortunately discriminating against infertile women. We have witnessed that one every four couple is infertile and 85% of this infertility is coming actually from infectious, infections, whether from sexual transmitted diseases, whether from female genital mutilation, whether from unsafe abortion or unsafe delivery. Why is this panel happening? This panel is happening because if we're talking about women empowerment, if we're talking about sustainable development goals, sustainable development goals, it's about access to health care. So this panel is about having access to health care. Sustainable development goals is about education. So here this is about awareness and education for women about why this is happening and about prevention. But it's also about changing the mindset and the negative cultural aspects that we are witnessing in our societies. How do we change this mindset? How do we know that a woman is a woman because she's a human being? She has all the rights. It is not related whether she has children or she has no children. But it's also about changing the mindset with reference to the couple. It's a shared responsibility. If we're talking about women empowerment, it is very important that she has access to all the tools of her choice, of the choice of being a mother or not being a mother. So this panel, you have seen that it is really about having all the power of Africa from the ministers, the academia, the parliamentarians, the private sector, how can we all work together with reference to empowering her socially, empowering her through access to health care, empowering her so that no one can come and throw her from her home, no one should come and beat her and she witness violence against her. If we're talking about violence and non-discrimination, which is the convention of of uh, elimination of any forms of discrimination against women, we have to say that this is real empowerment. And I am really very happy that this campaign is, has been led in Africa by my very good friend, Dr. Rasha Kalash, who is the Chief Social Officer of Merck, and also Professor Frank, who is really the, at the top of the leadership supporting this initiative for women empowerment. Very more than a mother has two many angles. One of the angles is create a cultural shift to respect and appreciate in society whether they can have children or not, they should be respected, appreciated, acknowledged by their role in the society and their role in uh, their families. Uh, raise awareness about infertility prevention. We said that infertility prevention is very important. Why? So we are also supporting education and training for embryologists and we send 
our first two embryologists to Indonesia for three months training, one from Kenya, one from Uganda, and the rest will follow after the success of the first stage. And then, of course, defining ARG policies. So we will speak today with the uh, Honorable Joyce Day, and she will tell us about the first approved ARG policy uh, by the uh, National Assembly, which is a great achievement and should be replicated in all African countries. The fourth uh, pillar is building advocacy and open dialogue with government, with policy makers, with academia, with health providers, with media, with stakeholders, different relevant stakeholders that we are doing today. So the social media and the media will post all what we are doing so to build uh, really advocacy for the post. And then empowering and protecting women, empowering them, so and improving access to information, awareness, and education, and change of mindset and empowering the infertile women who cannot have children anymore because of any uh, untreated causes to have their independent life by giving them a small investment to uh, establish their small businesses so they can build their own independent and happy life. So uh, this I think is a full-fledged campaign will uh, actually target all the multi-factor of uh, infertility uh, during our discussion, we will address a question to each uh, high-level uh, panelist from uh, each country to give us an idea about the causes and the, the, the challenges of infertility in their country and how can they find the partnership with Mary Mother and Mother will achieve this uh, uh, objective. And I will address my first question to uh, Minister Honorable Sarah Obindi, Minister of Health of Uganda and the, the ambassador of uh, Mother and Mother in Uganda. And uh, my question is that Minister Sarah will have kit uh, of Mother and Mother together in Uganda. And uh, I'm also at uh, the CSW 60 in New York. And can you tell us, as a Minister of Health and as an ambassador for Mother and Mother in Uganda, about the objective you are aiming to achieve from this campaign and how are you uh, aiming to make a culture shift to uh, change the perception, the social perception of infertile in, in, in the country? Thank you very much, Dr. Russia. Colleagues, past panelists, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, I want to thank Mark for picking on a subject that is known by everybody but not talked about. So I want to thank Mark for breaking the silence on infertility. Because we all know that often times in our own settings, in our own homes, when a woman fails to give birth, then she's the one who is left and not the man. So this campaign is going to help us to bring out the facts and say that infertility is a shared responsibility between the men and the women. In my country, in Uganda, between 10 to 15 percent of the couples that want to have a child annually fail to have children. So infertility is a problem that we all recognize. And of course, as said by Dr. Rasha, it can actually be prevented. So what we are doing as a country, what we have done since we had this campaign launched in February this year is first and foremost to recognize the problem but most importantly use the existing truck structures to actually provide services and information. In Uganda we have structures, health centers up to the health center too, that is the lowest administrative unit, that is at parish level. So we have reproductive health services that are provided free of charge at, this, at most of these health facilities. So what we as a country are, are doing is to ensure that now, moving forward from the time of the campaign, we first and foremost provide information to the health workers and also we expect the health workers to pass on this information to the mothers as they go to the health facilities. 
We have been looking at productive health and prioritizing issues of contraceptives and talking about family planning. But we now intend to have this campaign against infertility as one of the priority, uh, priorities on the productive health services. So, ladies and gentlemen, of course, Uganda also, we have had challenges regarding services to the mothers or the women and men who are infertile. Most of the services are provided, actually five clinics that provide, or hospitals that provide this service are in the capital city. So you find the countryside, the women in the rural areas cannot access this service. So this is a challenge, but a challenge that we all hope that we are going to address. Especially if we focus on prevention, and then the few that have challenges can then be attended to at government health facilities. And of course we hope that with this awareness that we are going to raise, we shall be able to also reduce the stigma. Because most of the people who, suffer, who have challenges with infertility have been keeping the problem to themselves. It's between them and their closest families and they don't speak up. But also, most importantly, we hope that with this campaign, the men will also take responsibility and be able to seek for treatment uh, at the selected facilities. As a government, of course, we are privileged that currently the government of Uganda is putting up a 320 bed women's hospital. So this will help us to focus more on matters of regarding maternal health matters and of course this will be one of the key services that will be provided at this government facility and we hope that we shall press that it be free of charge because this is going to be at the national uh, level. So ladies and gentlemen, of course the women that do not give birth are often looked at as women who are of no value, they are stigmatized and this we hope we can end. Every woman must be looked at as a woman, irrespective of whether she has given birth or not. You don't have to know me as a mother of so and so. Just like the men are looked at as men, and nobody asks whether they have given birth or not, the same should happen to women. We should all be equal as women, and of course from there, we can then be able to move forward and talk about equality between women and men. Thank you very much. Modified. 
They can be changed. A woman's rights, like Hillary Clinton said, is a human rights issue. Most time, as mothers, we try to please our men, our male counterparts. In our society, where FGM is performed, it's done by women, it's not by the men. In our society, when the daughter reaches puberty, the mom is waiting to see when she's going to get married. We need to change the way we do things. We need to change our minds. We need to change our attitudes. We need to treat our daughters equally as we treat our sons. You send the daughter to go fetch water while the son is playing football. But in my country, you want him to be the next George Weah. But now it's changing. Everybody wants the daughter to be the next Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. There was a time in the history of Africa anybody thought a woman would have been president because of our own culture and tradition. If we have to improve human rights, if we have to improve the rights of women, if we have to give our girl child the opportunity to go to school as equal as the boy child, we have to change our mindset. We have to change the way we think about tradition and culture norms. Traditions are fine, don't get me wrong, I love my culture, but they can be modified. Those bad practices that has to do with human rights, women's rights, those parts can be modified. Infertility, like she said, is not just from the woman's side. Let me tell you a story. My cousin and I got married at the same time. Both our parents were waiting for grandkids. I had two, and my cousin had none after five years of marriage. The husband's parents got impatient, and they both separated and went the different ways. Right after separation, my cousin got married to another guy and had twins. And the husband she divorced up to today has none. So it's not always the fault of the woman, but in our culture we always think it's the woman's fault. It's not time for us to speak out. Both men and women can be affected by infertility. But we need to change our mindset. We need to change our minds. We need to change our attitude on how we address the issue of women's rights and how we link it to human rights. Culture is good. I want to leave with this message that culture can be modified so the life of grace and the life of many other women out there and men can know that it's not their fault. It can be corrected. It can be fixed if we all give them the kind of support instead of blaming them. We want to be grateful to write that started in a few African countries. We hope that this campaign can be extended to other African countries so that the message, the awareness can grow. You have the issue of fistula. You have the issue of FGM or cutting. Early marriage. Teenage pregnancy. Let us add infertility to that list. Let us continue the campaign from a regional level, sub-regional level, to a continent level. I'm glad to see all of the parliamentarians here, the academians, the executive civil society. It has to be done together. Thanks to the organizers. Thanks to Mark. Thanks to all the invitation. I would like to introduce Honorable Joyce Day. She is a woman of parliament from Kenya parliament and she is my partner in the journey of Mary More Than a Mother from the start. She is the ambassador of Mary More Than a Mother in Kenya. Thank you very much, Marsha, and thank you to all the organizers of this Congress. Um, I think we've come a long way 
for us to sit high on this panel and discuss infertility, it is a big step that we have made as African and African uh, leaders. I think we should give ourselves a hand up for that. Because before you wouldn't have such conferences, people sitting down talking about infertility. Like you had even uh, before uh, other speakers, it is a taboo. It is, it's like you're a cast woman when you don't have a child. Everybody looks down upon you. And to have uh, somebody like me in a leadership platform, to even start talking about my own experience, it's, it's very difficult. But then when you become a leader, you have a choice, either to tell your story or to let other people tell your story. So I, I, I chose that uh, level of saying, this is the platform that the people have given me. I have to use the pl this platform in order to create awareness so that other people before me or behind me would not go through the same problem. Part of the video that you, you, you haven't seen is I had to adopt my own child because he was born from a surrogate mother. And the law that we had in Kenya that still is in Kenya does not recognize surrogates. So after my baby was born, the surrogate mother was a good friend of mine. So she had agreed um, for me to take the baby from day one. But then legally that baby was not mine. I mean, after everything that we produced, the agreement from the lawyers to show that the baby is mine because that was my egg and um, my ex-husband's sperm, but still they could not recognize that because the law that was in place says the woman who gives birth is the mother of the baby. So those who have children and a surrogate uh, process, they're not recognized by law. So I decided to, to take a longer journey because surrogacy is not new in our country. Women go through the same process, or couple go through that process, but then what they do, they go through the back door to get, you know, legal certificates for their, ch for their children. But then here I am, um, I've declared interest to become a leader. Nobody has ever seen me pregnant. Then what do I do? I said, I'll take the long journey. It doesn't matter how long it's going to be. It was in and out of courts and seeing the lawyers and the judges. It took us almost four years to now be able now to legally be recognized as the mother of, of my son. So I went through the normal ad adoption process. And when I got to parliament, I said, we have to change this law because we cannot let uh, any couple or any woman to go through this painful journey. And when I got there, uh, another member of parliament who was there, uh, previous parliament before me, had a draft um, on, on IVF. So what we did, we put our heads together and I championed for, for, for that bill. We, we called upon all the stakeholders, all the, the doctors and people who are in charge of infertility and, and IVF clinics in Kenya. And together we, we came up with a very good bill. And uh, in this bill, it recognizes you as a, as a woman who gets a baby, either through adoption or through surrogacy, uh, surrogacy process, to be identified as a mother of, of that child. And not just that, also to regulate the, the IVF process that has been happening in the, in the country and also to create awareness to tell people that there are other methods that you can use if you cannot conceive naturally. As we've seen in the video, like lack of information, lack of knowledge is uh, something that's really uh, making people suffer, making women suffer. Women are the ones who carry all the embarrassment, they carry the shame, they, they cry tears at, at night. And sometimes they're not the ones who are carrying that problem. It is a shared responsibility. I want to thank Matt because through this initiative, it has opened up conversation. It has opened up, uh, you know, talking amongst the men. Men are coming out also to talk about their problems. And one by one, we're seeing them accompanying their, their spouses to the clinic so that they know that it's not just a, a woman's problem, but also a man has that problem too. And uh, we're happy because now, um, just one week ago, we passed the, uh, we changed from IVF bill to assisted uh, reproductive uh, technology, so that now we can cover all the other methods that are, that are available, not just IVF. So already we passed that bill at the National Assembly, and it is the first bill actually in, in, in Kenya, Maybe in Africa, I'm not sure about other countries. In Africa, it is, it is the, the first period in Africa. And right now it, is, it has been taken to Senate.
and after Senate, it will come back to the National Assembly so that after that, the President now can, can sign it in, into law. So it is a, a biggest achievement that we have achieved as a women parliamentarians in Kenya. And uh, we're not going to stop there because if we don't take it down to where the people are, lack of information will still uh, you know, be like a, a bondage around them. Because sometimes we make good laws, but then uh, implementing those laws becomes an issue. And if they're not implemented, then we're not going to realize the, the, the culture shift that, that we are talking about. Because when we have more information going down to the people, then you find out they start talking about freedom and they have access to information, access to, to medical uh, treatment uh, for early prevention, early detection, and also so that the, the price of it or the cost of it can be affordable. Thank you very much. Professor Frank, did you see we have seen, yes, we have seen how the, the last speaker is talking about work and that it went to really the way for discussing this very important topic which was a taboo which is right. actually, I think it's the first time in Africa's history to really talk about this. Other topics were always on the, on the helmet, like FGM, SDGs, uh, uh, violence against women, but infertile women, it was a taboo. What do you think that her really opened this? How do you see that the, the success factors behind it? How you are initiating this? We want to hear from you because you are at the top of the leadership and we want to see how does this really, how you have initiated this and what are the success factors. And I can't give you any uh, sort of final answer to that <coughs> because there are so many very knowledgeable and empowered women around me <laughs> and I really mean it. Uh, because this problem is not only an African problem, you have to be aware of it. The same problem happens in Germany in our own families. And the moment a woman is not doing what God has given her to give birth to children, she's stigmatized. Never the man, always a woman. And that's awful. Yeah. That's the first thing. Second thing is, even in Germany, where we say we are relatively an advanced country, the stigmatization is there. So it's not only in Africa. It's probably much worse here because you are living in far more traditional societies. Still. So what can we do? See, when we uh, designed our Africa strategy at Merck in uh, 2012, we started. So we said, look, we really have to go to Africa. Uh, we have been here before, of course, in Northern Africa, we have been in Southern Africa, uh, but in West and uh, East Africa, we haven't been. So we said, we have to go there. Of course, we are a commercial company. That's not a secret. But on the other hand, because we've got the financial needs, we can do a lot of things. So it's one stone after the other. It was a capacity, capacity advancement program, and of course, uh, and now work more than a mother process, and many more will follow. It's about cancer, it's about diabetes, it's about infer infertility. And to do this, uh, we have to work, what I said before, closely together with the governments. Yeah? But at the end of it, yeah, all we can do is teach, to give advice to women, to teach, to try to overcome culture. And I'll tell you what. To change in culture is a harder thing to do. It takes a lot of effort from all. It has to come from top down, but it has to come from the bottom as well. And if you see this really very hard moving uh, testimonies yeah, uh, of all efforts, also yours, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, something we really have to, to tackle <coughs> in a very positive way. But we have to work on it and we have to be aware of the fact that that will not be over in half a year's time or a year's time. It's something we have to work on properly in the case of the generation. The best way to do is by giving an example, by giving testimony, uh, by governments and help. And I remember one discussion I had some uh, one and a half two years ago with a uh, German minister, because she was a junior minister, but still a minister, uh, about exactly this problem, about the uh, refunding of treatment of infertility in Germany. And she said to me, uh, oh, infertility is not an illness, why should we refund it? But you see, even, even in those levels, there's no acknowledgement of it. So, it's hard work, it's an uphill struggle. Uh, I think it's a very worthwhile cause to take on. Uh, as I said many times before, we need the help of the governments, we 
need the help of NGOs, we need the help of women uh, to, to come forward and speak up and to try to change it. Can't say anything else to it. It's not easy. But we will succeed in the end of the day. Absolutely convinced. Question go to Honorable Kidani, uh, Dorothy from South Africa, and he has uh, got, uh, got in uh, government in South Africa. So uh, we met last month uh, in uh, Johannesburg, and you showed your interest in uh, Better More Than Another campaign. And you actually wanted to uh, give the direction to help this unprivileged segment of women. You said to your team, these women need access and awareness to uh, empower them. And also you know about them to make a change uh, to decrease the stigmatization and social suffering of climate in South Africa. Can we elaborate on this? Thank you very much, Russia. I want to uh, acknowledge Mac and the role that plays to get us here. It's incredible really to be part of such a, an audience and to join honorable members academics and, and the senior representative from MEG and uh, my fellow colleagues uh, MPs. I think what we were discussing in Russia is uh, the problems are not unique uh, from what has been uh, stated here at this afternoon. We have the similar problem because of underdevelopment and poverty to a great extent. I think levels of unemployment as well uh, contribute significantly to that. I think what is important, we have a constitution that was adopted in 1996 uh, reproductive rights is enshrined in the constitution because of where we come from before, um, before during the era of apartheid. Uh, African women in particular were not allowed to have abortion. Uh, whatever abortion they did was illegal and many of them today cannot bear children simply because of that era. So that's why today the constitution has a, a clause that talks about reproductive rights and, and I think similarly to what is happening in Uganda, we've got clinics that women can access uh, a primary health care and particularly the reproductive uh, health services. We have a center, which is, um, we call it our center of excellence in one of the public hospitals. We provide uh, 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 health services relating to IVF, relating to sperm uh, uh, cleaning and sperm washing and all of that. And I think we've seen um, a couple of thousands of uh, couples who've come through the program as couples because they're HIV positive who have been assisted through that. And I think we talk about 6,000 or so who have come through the program, about 695 of them have been helped because some today they have children and, and they are really happy. So we believe that the work that we are doing in one public hospital, uh, because of the cost, uh, it is transforming people's lives and want to extend those services to the rest of the population. And why are we doing that? And I think it's been also emphasized that um, and I believe that there is a, an author who uh, 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 writes about economics who talks about empowering women uh, to be able to do things by themselves. And I think the issues of education is very important. And how do we want to see men um, working with us going forward? Uh, the center of excellence we have is very important. We've got doctors, nurses who are trained, as I said, the number of people, people that are assisting. It's a lot, but we'd like to see more education being given to the other uh, health facilities in the public sector because the costs are too high. Uh, currently, we spend between 6,000 and 12,000 then for IVF, then we can convert that to dollars and, and to, 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 to euros to see how much it costs. Yet, in the private sector, the costs are too high. So, we'd like to get training for our medical doctors as well as the, our nurses uh, in order to give the services to more um, and many of our patients in the public sector. And last of all, we make you be aware that there is work MEC is doing in one of our central hospitals, the second one, and um, it is presently in Maraguana uh, in giving equipment uh, to support the diabetic uh, patient uh, in that hospital. Again, the majority of those are women in the same hospital. We've invested in, uh, money in equipment of really um, of assisting women who've got fibroids. Uh, we cannot give birth, and the number of women who've got fibroids is at a increasing uh, rate in South Africa. So they live a compromised life, they cannot work because at any given point in time they're demonstrating and all of that. So that's what we are doing with, the, uh, with this new equipment that we've got. It uh, has seen a number of women uh, 
quality of life being improved for the better and we're hoping to invest more in dealing with that. So I think we can work together with MEG uh, in the number of equipment that we're investing into, but also in the education of our employees who are doctors and nurses. And lastly, just to really um, spread the message around the educating women to take responsibility and to be empowered. And I think the videos we've seen are phenomenal and like to have access to those so that we can share it with other women. Thank you very much. Infertility in Africa is different. We have many challenges than in developing countries. Can you just give us an idea about this and what is the expected outcomes of rolling out more birth for the mothers campaign in Nigeria and in the rest of the world? Thank you. Um, I think most people have said a lot about the difference. But what is unique from my over 40 years experience in infertility is very simple. There is no sin greater than ignorance. That was a famous, a famous quotation. And the problem of infertility in Africa is almost 70% ignorance. Because when you discuss the situation, you see this coming through. If they had known. It. And so, we must all thank men for rolling this process out to bridge the gap of ignorance. Through my uh, production of the productive health magazine, people used to tell me if they had known that this was there, then they won't have this problem today. And so, uh, like the words of this of it, I recognize no superiority in mankind other than goodness. So we must thank from that big man coming to his front team for the goodness that shows <coughs> to mankind. People believe that if they go to the priest or the pastor, fibroid can be healed. People believe if you tell them that, oh, you have very low sperm count, they say, I reject it. I reject it, and by, in the name of, they will mention whatever God, it will not happen. So, what are some of the things uh, that has not happened? That with the awareness, men, you see, when you say that 50% uh, of infertility is due to men, it's wrong. I, I tell my patient, actually, you are either 100% fertile or 0%. Mm. And in most cases, when these men have infertility, the wife is normal. But the man does not come to the clinic. So you are busy treating this normal patient. And sometimes this normal patient, they go to doctors who perform surgery on them. And they perform surgery and surgery. And by the time you see this patient coming for in vitro fertilization, the man has zero sperm. So, in the guidelines now, and I think we will pass the WHO guidelines to most, uh, which is now being circulated to most people in Africa. Sperm analysis is the easiest thing to perform in infertility. So men must accompany their wife to the clinic. It should be a mandatory thing. And we found out that when men follow the wife to the clinic, the success rate for fertility is higher. So, and there are so many, many other levels of ignorance. And what I can now tell you is that 
20 years ago, I could not tell people that my clinic is a fertility clinic. In fact, people could not want others to know that the baby they had was through seeing a doctor. That is how bad it is. But today, people are now coming and saying, yes, my baby was through a surrogate. So there is now acceptance, acceptance. And so we are on the road to improve my for the benefit of mankind, especially for women. So I think, and for mother, so I think I like to cut the discussion short and leave it at this point. Honorable Zuki Amongi, Chair of Ugandan Women Parliamentarian Association. What is the role of parliaments, you think, or you believe, uh, can uh, you mean improve access to regulating fertility care and effective fertility care, and how the women in parliament can contribute uh, to change social perception of fertility in Uganda? Thank you very much. Um, I think from the two video, we draw two clear lessons. One, that uh, there is need for a legal framework within which to support different scientific initiatives around assisted reproduction. When you, you hear what Joyce went through in, uh, in that video, as parliamentarians, I think we must applaud her for the stand she took to go through presenting the bill and at passing it at the level of parliament now waiting presidential assent. I think, thank you very much and congratulations to you. To that effect, I think as members of parliament, our role is to ensure that we make laws, laws that will ensure that the private sector and government can engage in research and all the essence around fertility treatment and assisted reproduction. Issues around surrogate mothers, even issues around adoption is still a contestation in many African countries. So this is something which, as parliamentarians, very important. The second aspect where we need to look at is budget allocation. These are sometimes very expensive venture for government and if as parliamentarians we don't bring it in the forefront of the public health agenda within the parliament, it becomes very difficult. So as women in parliament, we do understand, we do know what women like the lady who was in the video from Kenya was talking about how she was tossed around, she grew old, she wants to go back to her, where she was born at her home. Even the family members are chasing her away that you no longer belong here. Those are two prone approach. As parliamentarians, we can make laws on uh, removing those cultural barriers that subjugate women. Secondly, to put budget so that local women, even from the villages, the rural areas, can access fertility treatment through ensuring that Ministry of Health establish treatment centers and clinics in the rural hospitals and rural health centers where women like the one we have seen can access those treatments. We need to give information because all the women, we, we come from constituencies, we are voted by the electorate. If we can let them know that information through education, through information, through pushing the campaign, not at the city, but the campaign at the constituency level, so that women know the options available, women know where they can access the treatment, and women know how they can access that treatment is very important, and also ensuring that we appropriate money for training of health 
workers, the nurses that are manning these centers, the treatment centers. It is our role to ensure we put money in our different budget in our country to build the capacity of the nurses, the capacity of the doctors, because sometimes infertility doesn't present at the highest level where Mark is training embryologists. But there are those that are simple, uh, simple uh, lack of ovulation, which requires simple treatment, maybe at the lower hospital. Some of those treatment of STI, those are areas that we can support our government, bring the campaign in the forefront, put money and build the capacity of the nurses and the doctors to ensure that they can make necessary intervention to prevent infection and to ensure that they give relevant information to the patient. Thank you. The inability of a woman to become pregnant is a recipe for shame, ridicule, stigma, discrimination, and ostracization. The consequences are denial, access to family traditions, and property, divorce, physical and psychological violence. Women who are unable to conceive go to every length to own a baby, including looking for fertility treatment, medication, or even stealing a baby. In most cases, the culprit is the husband who acquired sexually transmitted infection without telling their wife. Got partial treatment, their reproductive system got dropped, and they are not able to impregnate the wife. However, all the blame is hit on the wife. At times, hyenas or men are hired to have sexual intercourse with her without her consent in order to impregnate her. According to the WHO, one in every four couple, couples in developing countries suffer from primary or secondary Fertility. In Africa, infertility is estimated at 85% compared to 33% globally due to infections. The social stigma of childness is very high in countries like mine, Malawi and leads to isolation and stigmatization. Men contribute to more than half of the infertility, yet women are considered a failure. Chairperson, I call upon all African women and men to remember that it takes two to tango. Let us change our mindset and ensure that the couple goes to fertility test before conclusions are made. The empowerment of women economically, socially, politically, morally and culturally to challenge certain norms is a means to remove stigma and discrimination. For example, in Malawi, Women who are escorted by their partners to antenatal clinics are attended to first. If they dodge the clinic, chiefs charge the man using by laws. Women are mostly in the forefront, ridiculing their own fellow women who is infertile, a special sister in laws. The practice must stop immediately. 
let us support one another. Legal instruments which allow the woman and her partner to go for a smooth test to fertilization and implant at the right time or surrogate pregnancy and delivery with a clear ownership of the child would be the most ideal. If the Kenyan example is to go by, most of the women would be happy, but lack of economic empowerment and would be the hindrance. It is, it is high time women should not hire men for childbearing if not not even to be dependent on men for everything. Education of girls, girl child, and economic empowerment of women are very critical. The topic fits very well into today's business. Let the African woman be self-reliant because they are already resilient to a lot of pressures. Finally, Chairperson, through you, Malawi is therefore inviting MEC to launch the program in Malawi. <clears throat> this time in October, during the World Rural Women's and Mother's Day commemoration, we are ready for the launch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. And uh, I would like to emphasize we watched Berna today together and we created Empowering Berna Initiative. This woman cannot have children anymore, cannot be treated anymore. We decided in work to support these women who cannot have children anymore by establishing small business in partnership with African Alliance for Women Empowerment so they can lead and build and develop an unhappy life. So I think this would be a great initiative. We started with Berna, we bought for her a chicken farm and she now will have to be a small business woman. She can depend on herself and make an income. So yes, economic empowerment is very important. How do you see this company will make a change? How do you see your role as Senator of the Commission of Health? A partner who is very more than a mother to deliver all the objectives of the company uh, you heard today and from me during our conversation and I know uh, the last two, three weeks. Thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, we cannot thank uh, Meg enough for this very uh, unique uh, initiative. Uh, when I was invited to come here, I, it, it struck me because I've never had this kind of initiative. You know, my brain uh, force uh, pensions and health settings. Um, first of all, of course, the job of a uh, parliamentarian is to introduce laws. And um, we have uh, this uh, summit, parliamentarians from about five different countries in Africa led by uh, Kenya. This Kenya is the first African parliament to introduce the DRC bill. And I believe Nigeria will be second. It's a challenge to my colleagues here today. Thank you very much. Um, a parliamentarian attracts a lot of publicity whenever he or she is introduced to a bill. And I believe introducing this DRC bill will definitely attract the publicity that uh, this initiative needs. And uh, I'm already trying to prepare how I will introduce this bill in Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria is a very peculiar country. First of all, we 
we have a population of close to 180 million people. And uh, we have uh, like 50% Christians, 50% Muslims. And the first point of call of any uh, infertile patient, in most cases, is always the church or maybe the mosque. They approach the Reverend Father of the priest because they believe that uh, the problem of infertility is more spiritual than physical. So our first uh, group of people to educate on infertility will be the priests and also the uh, imams in the mosque because they are the ones who first of all tell the patients that they are just messengers of God to tell the patients that God created the doctors and God gave the doctors the wisdom and the knowledge to be able to go into their system to know where the problem is physical. So which is a major uh, agenda in this uh, program to have a culture shift. Also, the parliamentarians in the country, they have a very big role to play because we are the ones that campaign all over the country, asking for their votes, and we also have a very good opportunity to educate them. So I intend to educate my colleagues as an ambassador to me of this program to ensure to ensure that in all our campaigns around the country, when we have a campaign, having our town hall meetings, we also have at least two or three sentences to say about the culture shift and also to propagate a mother, uh, more than a mother. Um, I believe this uh, education is coming at the, the best time. Because in Nigeria today, when you go to uh, one of the churches, because Nigeria has the largest churches in, uh, in Africa. We have some churches that are uh, populated by about maybe two million people in one service. Um, and it's, it's, in the, it's in the Guinness Book of Records that we have the biggest churches. So, um, during those services, the pastor will ask for couples that are looking for the fruit of the womb, they should come forward. And they cause different types of problems. People that have a uh, problem with their visas, people that have problems with the uh, school fees of their children. But in all these uh, calls, it's the, the largest people that come out, number of people that come out are people with the problem with the fruit of the womb which shows that it's a big problem in Nigeria. And in the peculiar situation here is like uh, where we have been saying since that it's only the woman that comes up, the man doesn't come up when this problem arises. But in the churches, we see the couples coming out together whenever they are called uh, for this problem for prayers. So that is also an area where we have to emphasize that it's uh, the husband and the wife that should seek uh, treatment for this infertility. Uh, in closing, uh, assuring Mark that um, I will do everything in my power to ensure that we make the loudest noise in Africa for more than a mother and me. Thank you very much. So I think now we will go to uh, Vice Chairman of the uh, uh, Tanzania Women Parliamentary uh, Caucus. Uh, this is uh, Honorable Susan Yipma. And uh, I would like to ask you what is the social description of Tanzania? We did not yet uh, address Tanzania in our uh, campaign. We talked about this campaign actually two days ago. And I want to, uh, to see your, you know, your own perspective and how do you see this campaign to make a change in Tanzania? 
that is the sperm and the egg. He is examining the fertilized egg, the embryo, to make sure that it is of good quality. And from his assessment, he will then inform and support the decision of the specialist in going ahead with recommended treatment. So it is a highly technical skill and it is more in the lab under the microscope. Now, his output is fundamental to the success of the pregnancy and the from the baby. And it is therefore critical input in the human resource requirement of ART. What is the situation in Africa? It is acute, severe, and deep. Take the case of Uganda, with under six clinics undertaking between five to eight hundred cycles of ARC in the year. There are only two Ugandan embryologists. That means the ratio of an embryologist per cycle is somewhere between 250 to 400 cycles a year. The recommended ratio is somewhere between 100. So that is the dire situation in most of uh, uh, Africa. It is in recognition of that, that Mark, who is a leader in innovation and sharing knowledge, picked up this gap and said, in discussion with African protein society, that we must do something about training of the employees. And that has kicked, started in Indonesia uh, four weeks ago, and that course is running for three months. But the importance of that, that, that training lies in seeing what has worked during that training and what has not worked so well. So that that training program is rolled out to the rest of Africa. I think this is the multiplier effect which we want to see come through from the training in Indonesia. And as we talk today, the two scientists undergoing training have reported that they have been committed to undertake research during their training time. Just to see how rapidly and how effectively they can undertake and reproduce the skills they are learning there in Indonesia. And I think this augurs very well for the future for themselves as they go back to their own country and also as they help mark and help African fertility society roll this through out Africa. So there is the future looking brighter. But I must also emphasize that the training is not for export. It is not for immigration that they go they, they, they go to seek better pastures elsewhere. This is training for Africa and that is the emphasis of this uh, multiply. Next issue is the relationship how when they come back to their own country, the level of integration in the services which my honorable minister is implementing. That is the preventive aspect. That the curative and preventive aspect will run concurrently with the trained clinical and embryologists. And of course finally it is integration that training with the policy of MAF, the policy of African fertility society at a regional and a global level. So I think that is the essence of it, that together we can cause the cultural shift, we can cause the change in clinical practice as well as in the scientific development. Thank you very, very much. My question goes for uh, Professor Santos Nicola. Uh, from Angola, the Dean of Augustine University, Angola. Uh, we had a lot of exchange of uh, newsletters of very important mother in different places.
services and you always encourage me go ahead I'm supporting you connect me with the uh, Minister of Health of Angola Professor uh, uh, Sampa and uh, he uh, expressed his uh, willingness to partner with us very more than a mother and I want to uh, see your uh, uh, feedback and overview about also emergency in Angola and knowing that Angola and, but I know that they share the same cultural environment uh, with the rest of the African countries. We need to know your uh, perception. Okay. Uh, thank you. The uh, grand problem is that the women are It is the problem is that we have uh, a stigma in the women. And muchas de las enfermas no
psychological problems, isolamento social, um, reject from the society, frustration and desespero. Frustration and Quero louvar a iniciativa desta campanha e parabenizar a organização. E dizer que nós em Moçambique, eu estou aqui pela primeira vez, quero agradecer o fato de ser convidada. And uh, it's her first time here and she wants to express her gratitude for the invitation. É preciso sim que sejam convocados parlamentares, governos, associações, para que o uníssono levantemos as mãos para a luta da estigmatização da mulher.
what you think about this campaign and how the infertility stigma can be addressed to Mary more than a mother with PPW intervention. Spanish, Arabic, French, French, French. So uh, I think only one minute because everybody is very tired. Me too. Uh, I, uh, first of all, when I saw the campaign, the video in New York, I said to Russia, why only I have done it? And, and she said, why are you asking me about it? And I'm a gynecologist, a and I know that it's all over the world, but some people didn't talk about it. In Latin America, in my country, Mexico, we have this problem, and it's exactly, exactly what we face in all over the world, I have to say. It's only about education, as Mandela said. Education, 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 education. This is the, the key point for us. The, uh, when, when you provide the, uh, the information and, and good education to your kids, they will not have these problems when they grow up. This is, this is a fact. So, um, uh, in Mexico, and uh, I, I'm going to Ecuador, I told you, uh, next month, and uh, Panama, Argentina, all of Latin America, we have the same problem than Africa. And if you go to Europe, you will find also this problem. But people keep quiet. Because really they don't want, sometimes they say it's a shame, sometimes they say, well, you know, it's not a big issue, and they just suffering all their lives. And uh, traveling all over the world, I find out something very, very, very important for me. We have machos all over the world. It's not only in Mexico. I grew up thinking that macho is only in Mexico. Macho Mexicano. No. We have machos in, in, uh, in uh, Australia, New Zealand. Please explain machos. Macho is like masculine, like very brave. You know this. You know macho, macho man, man. Everywhere, everywhere. Switzerland, Russia. Well, of course there are. So it's it's this kind of behavior that this part of our genes, I think so. So, it's, it's something that uh, in my office, when uh, a couple came and, and oh, we want to, uh, to find out why we are pregnant, they said, good, so we will start with you. And they were, good. <laughs> yeah, they don't want it, of course. Because why we, we, I will spend so much time review and have a test with uh, my patient when it's only one, one test for me. One. So what? I'm very cheap. So this is the point for me that we have to, to uh, have a better education. We have as NGOs in many, many countries, we have a free time in the medium as a beauty when they start uh, a channel, a TV channel, or radio, ch radio channel, but they didn't promote it. So look for this free time for NGOs and universities in your local media or national media so you can promote campaigns to avoid this kind of problem. They will never tell you that they can give it to you free time. So this is, and I hope so that we we can uh, uh, do a very good campaign for Latin America and, and other countries. And as a doctor, it's very weird, very 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 weird that we can find a pharmaceutical that are really fully involved in a problem supporting. It's very, 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 very weird. They invite us as a doctors to the conference and pay the hotel and blah, 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 because they want our residents. But doing this campaign to support the communities for nothing, putting a lot of money
morning. Really, a big applause for Mary. Honorable <laughs> Lorette Andre, a member of Parliament of Côte d'Ivoire. We are coming to the bar a vision very soon in October, 19th and 18th of October, to have our very active where we have more than 300 healthcare providers from across African continent, African continent, for building capacity for non communicable diseases, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, fertility, and thyroid dysfunction research, and also life science. So, Oui, c'est 
embarrassing. So that's just one simple example. I don't have time to go through it. So these are the stipulations. And the PHO, I mean the IFS has equally invited men to participate at this World Congress, which will come in September in New Delhi. September 2016, the 23rd of September, at the breakfast meeting, which uh, we are happy to welcome on. And we hope they will respond to our invitation and collaborate. And I think, in, on the final analysis, the African Fidelity Society is proud and happy that we have been able to collaborate with the man in bringing this process to Africa. I agree that infertility is a global problem, but the most we in Africa, we suffer it 